Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this on this Sunday of All Saints. It is the time in the church where we remember just how wide the witness to Jesus Christ is in the world. It spans centuries and it spans every continent on this earth. And so as we remember our saints today, we hear the good news that sustain them in times of persecution, in times of trial, and also gave them hope. And we also remember the saints who have been in our midst, uh, beloved members of this community, those in our families, and everybody who witnessed to Jesus Christ in front of us. It is an amazing thing how the gospel transforms our lives and those places where it happens we call these people saints so for all of you saints who are assembled today here in worship with us uh, those of you who are saints worship, worshiping with us at home on my phone so i don't know what kind of quality we're going to be uh, dealing with and if there are any issues at home i'm going to apologize beforehand but i'm so glad that you are here worshiping with us and so now i invite you to prepare your hearts and your minds for worship <laughs> stand. We are a church that lives into God's future today. A church united across space and time. A church of many races, languages, and ethnicities. A church that lives by the word of God and joy that was, is now, and is still to come. The one who is seated on the throne said to, uh, says to us, See, I am making all things new. Lutherans follow directions. <laughs> a new heaven and a new earth. Where the, Where the whole of God is among God's people. God's future is epic, and it's good news. Remember God's future for this is our story. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Living God, in whom there is no shadow or change, we thank you for the gift of life eternal, and for all those who, having served you well, now rest from their labors. We remember the great ancestors of our faith, from Abraham and Sarah to Paul and Phoebe. Ancestors of faith, we remember you. We remember the prophets and priests, the ministers and teachers who have taught us the way of God. Teachers of faith, we remember you. We lift up the memories of children and grandchildren, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives and parents whose lives ended too soon. Those close in our heart, we remember you. We lift up to you, O God, the names of those that we have lost this past year from our lives knowing that they are in your heart forever. 
Remember all those who've died from COVID-19 and those who na whose names are not known. So we read these names, we pause, we will pause after every name to remember, pray, and give thanks for their life. Jerry Shelton. Margaret Langevin. Rich Rogers. Morris Walker. Becky Riley. David Pardew. Joanne Hartow. Robert Ward. Thomas Ward. Edward LaBarbera. We celebrate the lives of those we have named, O oh Lord, and so many more who we carry in our hearts with us this day. Family of God, we remember you and we honor you. We know you are with us in the spirit of worship, and you will not be forgotten. We give thanks, O oh God, for all who have gone to join with you beyond this life. We trust in the hope of resurrection and the promise of new life in Christ and know that in our grief and celebration of God, you are with us through it all and we are not left alone. In the name of Christ, in whom love lives forever, we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is one of my favorites for all the saints. It's in number four. It's, well, it doesn't matter now. It's in the <laughs>
So singing all seven verses of that is probably the hardest thing you'll have to do today. <laughs> so, uh, but it tells a story. I couldn't, I was putting this together and I was like, I can't cut these middle verses out because you go from the beginning to the end. And you're like, What's happening? So anyway, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we can confess that we are knowledge to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may die in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God of the saints, when our souls make us sad or weary, you are there to give us rest. Meet us on our way, fill our hearts with your sacred silences, and call us by your word to do your will for your world and for our neighbors. As we go about our labors, fill our hearts with thanksgiving for the witnesses before us who rest from theirs. Amen. You may be seated. I invite any children who are here to come up for the children's sermon. Just two of you today, huh? So are you going to know it's going to multitask? It's good to see you, Jojo. Uh, I want to tell you guys something. So I was kind of busy over the last week, and I invented something. You guys want to see my invention? Okay, I'm gonna, I figured I'd try it out for the first time in church. Thanks, buddy. All right. This is something I invented, and it is a saint detector. Did you do that at home? I did it at home. Yeah, that's what I do when you go to bed. I know stuff. So. <laughs> so. You're joking. <laughs> so. This will tell you what a saint is. Can we see what it is? is? Um, I don't know. I'm scared if it'll work. Jojo, you want to try this out for the first time? Just go in there and tell me what you see. Okay? You ready? Alright. Everything's working okay? Yeah. Okay. You see you? Okay. Alright, so I guess you're a saint, Jojo. I you know what try? happened? You took that off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? I remember seeing that. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we broke the fourth wall in here. But <laughs> you wanna you wanna come see? You wanna come see my saint corner? Tell me what you see. Tell me what you see. Looks like a the flame. <laughs> yep. And what's in it? What's in the middle of it? What do you see? God. <laughs> oh, God. He's going to be a pastor. <laughs> what do you see? <laughs> okay. So do you guys want to use this on the congregation? Right. See if you can find any saints out there. Tell me who all the saints you can find are. 
And that seems to take the roof. The roof? Okay. What do you see? I see it. What do you see in there? I see, uh, I see, I see here. Is everybody in here? Oh, yeah. Did the safe detector pick up yes. everybody in here? I don't know what I see. <laughs> I see. Oh, my gosh. I uh, see. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I see me stand. Yeah, you see me stand. Everybody in here. Oh, my gosh. So, what does that tell us about who a saint is? A saint is something that shows where you are. Yeah, well, and. <laughs> Yes, a saint is somebody who is you. loved by God. And who is loved by God? You. And then Jojo, do you know who, who who's loved by God? You? Me? Me too? Who else? Pastor Marta. Pastor Marta, not here. <laughs> nice shout out. Everybody. Miss Dana. Everybody. <laughs> A saint is somebody who is loved by God, and that's everybody. So each and every person that you meet is a saint who is deeply loved by God. And the best thing about saints is that saints get to love one another. They get to play games with one another. They get to encourage one another. What are some they other play things? play Super Mario World. Yeah, saints get to play Super Mario World, too. So a saint... Yeah, just like we have. So a saint is literally everybody that you meet who is loved by God and who will show you in different ways how much God loves you. So that's the special day that we have today. You took that off the wall. I did. I did. did I, I'm going to put it. Oh, oh no, I just no, broke no, it. Oh. No. You're not telling mommy about that. Should I will. <laughs> well, the frame is okay. We'll get a new mirror. So. So, thank you so much, guys. Go out there Dad, and find some saints. Yes. You can never do that again. Okay. <laughs> or mom will get mad at you. Mommy gave me permission. <laughs> and we'll get mad at you. Okay. I can mention, huh? Yeah. And never do that again. I, like, you bring your kids, and then it breaks the fourth wall. Yes. So, <laughs> so uh. I will, and I'll probably probably have to go pick up a new mirror on the way home. <laughs> so now uh, we have special music. And also, don't forget your
from the first book of Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 18. It's a little lengthy, so you may stay seated. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. And he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat. Otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on the way, on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram, and also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat of Abel Meholah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, every mouth that has not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Please stand. According to St. John, the twelfth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? 
Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. The voice, then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now for most of my life, being a saint meant effort. I imagined that holy life worked the way that ordinary life worked. Life was effort too. Brush your teeth, clean your room, get good grades, be nice, love people, feed people, say good things, do a miracle or two. So I thought the measures of sainthood were just on the top rungs of the ladder of, of, the ladder of effort that made uh, human life. Sort of like a spiritual version of extra credit. My knowledge of saints as a child came from church windows like the ones uh, that we have here and maybe from the St. Francis statue that we kept in our backyard. Sainthood was all about halos, radiant light, good deeds, and churchy athleticism. You know, all that stuff that is beyond normal humans. Is that a party uh, last night and somebody was telling me, you know, I'm not a saint. I'm not a saint. And I went, well, God might have something to say about that. Now, I <laughs> I went to a uh, Catholic school that did nothing to alter this picture that saints were these kind of spiritual superheroes. Now, the namesake of my school was Saint Ignatius Loyola, and he wrote a prayer that we said every day in homeroom. I still say this, Lord, teach me to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed for wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not ask for reward, save that of knowing that I do your will. And try to ask your teacher for less homework after saying that prayer every day. Right? I didn't grasp then what I know now as a Lutheran minister, because Lutheran catechesis is horrible, but uh, I didn't grasp what I know now as a minister, that saints are made in baptismal fonts. Sainthood for me as a young man came instead from the, food, from the boot camp of serious striving in daily life. Few actually got there. The Pope would probably not ever know your name, but as long as you were making the effort, it counts. And I still think it's funny how people relate to clergy as if we are these kind of spiritual athletes. Uh, at a wedding I did a week ago in New York for Marissa's family, I was walking around in my clergy collar around a bunch of ex-Catholics or Catholics that maybe uh, you'd see around Christmas or Easter, and people insisted on giving me drinks and then letting me cut in line, right? I was in... I, I heard the scallops were really good, so, you know, you guys that know me know how I do. I'm like, well, I'm going to go get those, and, you know, sometimes food gets in the way of propriety, and I reached over this poor old guy, and then he, he just, I apologized, and he patted me on the back and said, oh, I need all the help I can get. You just get all the scallops you want, right? The thought must be that, that people who work for churches must put in more time praying or being good or just absorbing positive vibes from God because we stand a little higher on some pecking order. Let me assure you that's not true. And at least for me, it's not true. The work we do is just like any other work. And the times that my work feels powerful and uplifting are super rare. You've probably heard about it when I have, because most of my day is just the slog. I'm juggling a million things, work, family, just like everything else. Doing holy, quote unquote, work doesn't feel really holy to me. It feels like just a job. The times I do remember to pray or talk to God in the midst of it are more rare than I'd like them to be. Usually I'm apologizing or getting a scolding. Even being a pastor, it feels like when it comes to holy things, I'm doing my best to get through, 
rather than getting anywhere. I doubt I'm the only one in this room who's felt run ragged or tired or worn out or depressed or feeling like it's just too much or have just looked at their lives and been buried under a mountain of tasks, needs, bills, maybe caregiving for a loved one or for a pet that all seems endless. And so Elijah, who, by the way, if, uh, if people during the time of the Old Testament did what we Christians do and make images of people to have in their places of worship, Elijah would be pretty close, right? Elijah would be in everybody's top two. Uh, they're the ones who showed up at the transfiguration uh, with Jesus. Uh, and we find Elijah here probably in the same boat that many of us have been in, or let's be honest, a little worse. I don't think anyone, anyone has ever run from somebody trying to kill them. Uh, if you have, we can, we can talk. Now, as we begin our story, he has walked into the desert for a day and collapses under what we translate as a quote unquote broom tree. Now it's funny, like when you're reading the Bible, sometimes people, when they're translating, they're like, it's the Bible. It's, it needs to be like majestic, right? So you say broom tree and you think of this big, beautiful willow in the woods. You know what these things are, right? Do you guys ever look in the desert, out in the desert, and you see just like shrubs or these like little little pieces of brush out in the desert? This is literally what they are. He is, he is uh, falling down by a desert shrub. And I don't know if you've ever had a day or a night where you just pass out into some shrubbery, but this was Elijah's day. It's probably the worst time of his life. And ironically, it's also after the best time in his life. If you read the whole story in chapter 18, Elijah enters into that famous contest with the priests of, of Baal. Now, you've probably seen or heard of Battle of the Bands, and this was kind of like a battle of the gods. Uh, for those of you like Mary who saw the Rolling Stones last night, this is as rock and roll as the Bible gets. First Kings 18, give it a read. So the priests of this sky god can't get their god to come down and claim their sacrifice no matter how much they rant and scream, but Elijah just says some words and fire consumes the sacrifice and the entire set. I don't care what band you are, you cannot match these special effects. So for losing this particular contest, the consolation prize was getting stomped on by an angry mob and killed by a victorious prophet. Uh, Elijah got to literally be rock and roll and murder false prophets, or not murder, but kill false prophets uh, down by the river. And I don't know if any of you have had a day like the end of The Godfather Part 1, where you get to smite all your enemies, but Elijah got to have that day. Imagine that. I know it's church. Maybe I shouldn't tell you to imagine that. But Elijah got to have that day where he's murdering all his enemies down by a river. Uh, you know, you, you have to feel like he, he's like, I'm at the top of my game. I serve the correct God. And so here's a guy who went from being a prophetic rock star to a wanted criminal hiding out in the woods. It's a towering high to an all-time low at a record pace. He feels it. He is what we would call suicidal. He's not going to do it by his own hand, but he says in one sentence, Oh, Lord, take away my life. He's here in our story asking God if he can die. Now, he'd done everything right. He climbed the ladder. He did all the saintly stuff. He listened to God. He told God's word without flinching. He took care of widows. He faced down injustice and a powerful but very cowardly king. He's brought comfort to people struggling in famine. And in the face of a nation where so many have turned to other gods, Elijah has stayed faithful. His heart is exactly in the right place. His use of the word here, I have been very zealous 
for the Lord means that I have done everything that you've asked. This is effort like none other. Paul will talk about his zeal in his former life as a rabbi, and we're about to hear all these wonderful promises in uh, from the prophet Isaiah. And if you hear in Isaiah 9, where it says that the God, God is going to send a Messiah, and what does it say at the very end? The zeal of the Lord of hopes, or of the Lord of hosts, will accomplish this. He has zeal. His heart burns to do God, God's will. All the things that the bad preachers on the radio tell you you need to do, uh, Elijah is doing them. But Elijah, for all of this effort, has just collapsed into a bush. No jet plane for this guy, just a bush. All his effort, all his heart, his determination, and all those cliches you hear in sports movies and bad sermons, all of it. It's not good enough. And it is right here with Elijah passed out in a bush that God teaches Elijah and all of us what sainthood really is. The angel of the Lord meets Elijah at that moment after he has passed out. You guys have to read the Bible slowly. The angel gently touches him. It's incredible tenderness. And then the angel feeds him. And at first, Elijah is too tired to get up. And anyone who's tried to get a child up to go to school, uh, maybe a little more patience than you have. The angel says a second time, get up. You need to eat or the journey is going to be too much for you. Kind of like the end of Moana, if you've seen it. The true cure for the way Elijah has felt was not a pep talk, but a good nap, a cake, and a cup of water. And that uh, meme that floats around the internet about when Elijah said, I'm so angry, I'm about to die, and then God just kind of feeds him and tells him to take a nap. That is a prescription for us as well. But the story for Elijah continues. The angel leads him to real shelter in a cave on Mount Horeb. It's not just passed out in a bush anymore. And it's, not, and it's there not in a fury of signs like wind, fire, and earthquakes, right? Elijah had done signs like this with all of the natural elements, right? All that rock and roll stuff that Elijah has spent a career smashing out on kings and false prophets. God finally speaks to Elijah in that famous, still or literally thin, small, thin voice and makes promises to him. And says, look, Elijah, you're not the only one. I'm going to raise up 7,000 people who also are just as zealous, who also have not bowed their knees. And even more importantly, God says to Elijah, go make yourself a successor. Don't think that you have to do this all by yourself. Elijah had lashed out because Elijah felt alone. And God said, no, you're not alone. I'm here. And he said that God said that God was there in, in three ways. First, by doing what God absolutely loves to do. God is your grandmother, brothers and sisters. God gives food, water, take a nap on my couch. They, your grandparents are modeling God for you in that way because this is what God longs to do. God also shows that God is there with Elijah by pursuing Elijah and saying, what are you doing here? Just like with Adam and Eve when they ran away and God said, where are you? God always begins this engagement with God's people through a question. Where are you? What are you doing? Let me hear you speak too. 
And then God shows Elijah that Elijah is not alone by saying, I'm going to give you other people. Elijah, this is not about your personal relationship. Elijah, this is not about all of the check marks. It's not about your effort. This is about my people who I am calling to my name and the promises that I have made never go anywhere. And all of this, brothers and sisters, is a master class about what real saints look like. Our sainthood kicks in not at the point where we've reached peak holiness or, we, or we've uh, achieved some form of uh, secular sainthood either in a gym or a corner office or getting a retreat, a retweet from somebody famous on Twitter. Sainthood is not waiting for us at the finish line. Instead, what is truly holy, good, loving and merciful and perfect meets us when we're tired, when we need a break, and when we're passed out in the bushes. Saints aren't made in cloudy perches. The best place to find saints is not saint stained glass windows. Sorry, Peter and Paul. They are blessed. They are sanctified. They are cared for most when they pass out on those prickly bushes. They are not measured in what they do, but they are built up in what they receive. Concrete gifts for concrete needs, food and drink from the hands of angels, and even silences around them scream with the voice of God, where are you? What are you doing? And they are never alone. No saint is a one-man wolf pack. Saints are there for one another, building one another up, encouraging one another. Even in one generation to the next, saints are bound together in the life and work that we all share. We are all here because of a saint. For me, it was my dad who dragged me to church even though my mom was, was working and uh, even though I didn't want to go for... Um, for so many others, there's that person who showed you what faith is. There's that person who opened the Bible for you and made it maybe mildly interesting or showed you how important it was. Our faith would be impossible without the saints who came before us, put the Bible in our hands, invited us to church, and told us the good news with their words. And as I get to see when I do funeral after funeral, demonstrate the good news with their entire lives. And when I think of the faces of saints who used to grace this place and are here no longer, I tremble with gratitude. We are still, it's God's light, as you know, some of them would be quick to tell me, but it's their light too that God has given us. And I am always trembling with gratitude and I'm a little sad too, but we'll do support group later. <laughs> Saints are not muscular, spiritual people who triumph over great odds. I'm super excited for the Kurt Warner movie, but that's how NFL quarterbacks are made, not saints. See, <laughs> saints are not made. Saints are claimed. They are fed, encouraged, forgiven, blessed, made new, and travel wherever they go and do whatever they are called to do because God calls them and will not leave them to do it alone on their journey. To be a saint means to be somebody who God has made holy with God's zeal, God's raging desire not to give up on anyone called beloved, God's insane effort to claim every weakness, struggle, grief, anguish, sin, and doubt with a cross and say, hey, these are mine and so are you. And we see all this power not only in our own life, but in the lives of those around us. Now, I, uh, unless you think I, I uh, would knock my beloved alma mater, it, the greatest saint I ever knew was Jim Skirl who was our theology teacher. Uh, his Christian manhood class, it was an all-boys school, his Christian manhood class was amazing. He basically just showed you a bunch of movies and you talked about them. And you always thought it was a really easy class, but man, did you ever learn a lot about yourself, a lot about God, and a lot about one another. He was very smart in the way that he taught us. And he was a former 
basketball player and was about seven feet tall and was a giant in spirit as well as stature. He was very smart, he was hilarious, and he was loving. You could never be in a bad mood around him. He just would walk the halls. I, I have been a teacher before. I know on my break, I'm not looking for students, but he would just walk the halls looking for people who were having a hard time and talking to them. He just radiated Christian loving. And I was so proud when he agreed to write a reference for me as I entered candidacy. And it was much more kind and glowing than it needed to be or should have been. Now, just to give you a taste of his faith, a fellow faculty member stated that when Jim Skirl's cancer finally started wearing him away, he entered into his final time at the hospital. He got on his knees at the side of the bed and prayed. Now, when the faculty member jokingly said, praying for your soul, Jim Skirl responded with sincerity, no, just thought I would pray for everyone who's been in this bed before me and who will be in it after me. Now, who thinks like that? But for all his great prayers and lessons, one got seared onto me like a tattoo. Now, Mr. Skrull was the teacher who started a Sunday night ministry driving around and meeting people without homes and just like the angel did to Elijah, offering food and, and drink and maybe a little bit of conversation. Now, most of the time, this was a pretty fun uh, affair of hot cocoa and adventures in parts of town that most people avoided. But there was one time outside the convention center where one man spoke to us in shocked disbelief about his condition. The story was hard to hear in his sobs and tears, but we all got the gist, and I'm sure that so many of you in here have lived it. He was recently homeless. Family was far away. He couldn't believe that it was happening. A few of us tried to speak some words of comfort in a way where it almost seemed like we were looking for permission to move along and hand out the rest of our sandwiches and, and Doritos. But in the midst of all that, Jim Skrull stooped down. The man was sitting against the entrance doors to the convention center. He stooped down with his giant frame, grabbed that poor grown man, and held him in a bear hug as real tears flowed down both of their cheeks, and as the man cried, letting out sobs and wails. It lasted maybe 10 minutes, but the impact of that moment on me was more powerful than 10 hours of sermons. I've channeled that moment, the bedsides of more people than I can count, and it's not in my or anyone else's effort but in that embrace, that sainthood finally made sense to me. The memory of that embrace on a cold night as a wintry wind blew in off Lake Erie has been the true icon of sainthood to me, the true image of holiness. That embrace was just a glimpse of the same love which with, with which we hang on to one another, both of us still here and to those who we mourn and remember. And that embrace was a taste of that same giant bear hug, which God gives us now and into eternal life. So if you wanna be a saint, just hold on and be held. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of the day is, it is well.
the faith that makes us holy, the faith that makes us saints. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, we call us saints not because of our deeds, but because of the holy gifts that you give us. From you, we receive our calling, our talents, our patience, our courage, and our faith. As you lead us as saints in our lives, nourish us continually by the witness of those who came before us. In remembering them and in mourning them, may we be taught to share in the hope of the eternal life that they now enjoy. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we remember the witness of your saints in every kind of trial and persecution and in doing acts of mercy. Wherever people are persecuted today because of oppressive governments and religious intolerance, give hope and endurance. Wherever pain, suffering, and injustice continue for want of faithful people standing up, bring courage. Wherever there is loneliness, fear, or despair, send us to be saints to one another, reflecting your own holy zeal to bring life to all creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, violence and tragedy continue to impact our own community as well as the rest of the world. In the midst of awful acts of violence, negligence, only your cross can heal the trauma and grief that arise. We pray for all those impacted by needless loss of life. We pray for your healing and forgiveness on those who cause these things. We pray that as a community, we may learn to bless, care for, and help one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all creation, just as in the waters of baptism, you call us your children and claim us as your saints. Through the waters of the earth, you nourish our land, help crops grow, and satisfy the thirst of every living thing. Help us to preserve and tend well to the resources of water you have given us even in the desert. Help us treat all our resources as our gifts and help us to share them with our neighbors and all creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of justice, we pray for all our leaders who are engaged in the work of serving our community, nation, and world. Help all places and people work together. May you bless and strengthen an ethic of prudence and sacrifice and build us all up in our many callings to serve you through serving one another. The Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing, we remember before you all who are sick or suffering, especially the people in this congregation that we love, especially Pat's brother-in-law, Morris, Maria, Richard, Allison, Donna, Kay, Tony, Bob, Eldon, Ellen, Chris, Pat and Eileen, Kelly, Bob, and Debbie, Sharon, Peggy, and Wendell, Pete, Debbie, and Dennis, and all we name before you aloud, or in the presence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you always. And also, you share that peace with one another. As we have received freely, so we give to one another freely, so that the gifts of God may continue 
here in this place for all who worship here, for all who seek help and recovery here, for all who eat meals here, and for all in this community we seek to serve. And so now we offer our lives and our times. Pray. Merciful giver, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the witness of the saints, you show us the hope of our calling and strengthen us to run the race set before us, that we may delight in your mercy and rejoice with them in glory. And so, with all the saints, with the choirs of angels and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
body of Christ to get over you. blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you now and into eternal life. Pastor Matt said I am the church council president. Last week, uh, Jason, Pastor Jason shared uh, about giving and how your giving affects our community, how we, we reach out and touch so many lives who walk through these doors every week. Well, this morning, I'm here to talk about our staff. Our staff of our pastor, our uh, church secretary, Mary, Pastor Matt, Marissa, uh, Dr. Lee, and uh, not to mention Alfie, who keeps our bathrooms clean. Uh, they all benefit from our giving. And in essence, we are their employers because our giving pays their salaries. I'm happy to say that in 2020, when the pandemic hit, we did not have to cut any salaries or hours. In 2021, when we made up the uh, the budget for the year, we did not have to cut any budget or any hours or salaries. And I'm hoping that, that in 2022, with your faithful giving, maybe we're able to finally give our staff a raise. <laughs> but that comes from us, the church, who are the employers of these people who keep the doors open, who answer the phones, who lead us in worship, who provide beautiful music, and like I said, Felfi, keep the bathrooms clean. <laughs> so, um, just to, uh, I don't want to uh, give another sermon here, I just want to keep it short, but I just want to thank you all for your generous giving week after week so that we can continue to employ staff who do so many untold things for our church, for our community, and keeping these doors open. Thank you. And uh, she is not kidding. There was a uh, church in the Twin Cities that was advertising. We have the cleanest church bathrooms in the, in the Twin Cities. <laughs> I don't know if it was a joke or, but that's so important to uh, our, our our witness um, in ways that you would never imagine. So thank you all for coming to uh, worship today. When I signed up for seminary, I never thought I would come to be called out by my own son and uh, break household items. Um, 
So uh, it's always incredible uh, to be here uh, and to just kind of roll with it. Um, it is uh, it is not a production here. It is the worship of God, and we are who we are uh, in front of God and sometimes in front of one another. So um, I'm so thankful to be here uh, with you today. Thank uh, thankful too for uh, the music. Uh, thank you. Thankful for everybody who steps up uh, to help. Uh, it is truly a wonderful place to be. Um, the biggest news uh, coming um, of events that are going to happen here, Jerry Shelton's memorial service uh, will be held Saturday, November 20th um, here at 11 a.m. Um, in the sanctuary. Um, so those of you who um, have had the blessing of knowing uh, the Shelton's um, it, it, please uh, come and encourage others to come uh, to give them love and support here. Um, every Sunday, you should see it is November, um, but we are having a food drive. Um, we don't need to do anything too extravagant. Uh, I don't know how they are doing on peanut butter, uh, but just any items. Um, you know, if you're, um, if it, you know, if you just happen to be at shopping and and you have a chance and go you know what i'm just going to pick up a couple things and bring them to church um that will be appreciated uh today uh one of the most vital issues um in our community in my opinion and certainly nevadans for the common good opinion is housing and how we will address uh the housing crisis um, and so today, from 2 to 4 p.m., um, there will be a meeting at the Roman Catholic Diocese of Las Vegas, not too far from here, um, at Anderson Hall um, at 336 uh, Cathedral Way. Is there anything that you want to say about any of that briefly, Paul? No. Oh, okay. It's there. Good. I covered it. Excellent. And then um, and then there, I guess there's a Lunch and Learn as well um, on Sunday, November 21st. Um, and that'll be here in two weeks. Um, and so today, uh, there will be a Sunday school for the little ones. Uh, there is youth group today. And um, in adult Bible study, we will be uh, continuing in the book of Exodus. Uh, and we're going to see um, the kind of final climactic moment on God's battle with Pharaoh. Uh, and we will learn a lot about who God is uh, through Pharaoh's uh, request and confession. So um, I invite you to come uh, very soon at 1030 in Edwards Hall for adult Bible study. Uh, with that, for the good of the order, please stand. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Oh, and Peggy, if you're watching, very happy birthday. <laughs>
God. God.